Michael. A dangerous moment there. Was it? Did the parrot like you? Uh, well, no. I mean, shortly after that, that little clip there, I was uh, looking at another parrot and I felt this sort of tugging at my, at my trousers around about my right knee. And I looked down and there was this beautiful sort of white cockatoo so just gently sort of tugging at my, at my trousers, I thought this was rather sweet, you know, rather Francis of Assisi, here I was, you know. Not a little nip. With the animals, absolutely, little, 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 um, little just a slight little tug there. And so I called the camera over, I said, look at this, this is really jolly nice. And as the camera came in, I realised it wasn't going to let go, and it actually was going for my kneecap, <laughs> this, this bird, and it had a very strong beak indeed. So after a bit, it was just trying to pull the damn thing off, you know. So <laughs> they are extremely strong, and if I'd been wearing short trousers, God knows what might have happened. <laughs> The famous parrot sketch. Did, yes. Did, uh, did Graham Chapman write that? Uh, Graham co-wrote it with, uh, with John. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, I have a feeling, it may be, may be wrong, John would correct me on this, but I think it was Graham, it was sort of typical idea of Graham's that it should be a parrot that someone brought back to a shop. I mean, it could have been anything, a used car or a sort of, you know, a Kenwood mixer, sorry, a mixer. <laughs> um, not from Kenwood. Oh, so it again. <laughs> um, <laughs> That didn't work, but it, I think it, it was probably Graham's sort of idea that it should be a parrot. He was wonderful on sort of instinctive moments of, of lunacy like that. We've just got a picture of Graham there. It's, um, of course, just suddenly this recent bad news about him. Mm. It was the 20th anniversary, wasn't it, that you were getting together for? Yes, yes, the 20th, uh, 20th anniversary of the first Python transmission uh, was on October the 5th. Mm. Um, and Graham died actually the night before. Extraordinary timing. We laid on this great party. Terry said it makes Graham the greatest par party pooper of all time. Which is something I think Graham would have enjoyed because yes. he, was not, he was not a man of much truck with the sort of the sentiment, sentimental side of, of death and all that. He, was, uh, he loved life. He was a great, he was very intelligent and very wise man, Graham, mm. actually. He was a doctor and took an interest all the time in, in sort of how things worked and all that. And when he was very ill, we visited him in hospital. And he just, he would explain, you know, very clearly with great articulation and great humour and some dignity, what was happening to him. Mm. Well, that pipe leads in there, I'm not quite sure where it goes, I think it comes out here. And uh, yes. he was absolutely terrific. And, and I mean, for someone to go through what he did in the last year of his life, which was some extraordinary nasty operations, mm. and to retain that humor and that, that sense of life um, was absolutely terrific. And I think we all sort of, the petty differences we might have had in the past in mm. Python were just forgotten. And, uh, and it, was, it was really good that we all saw him and we all got together you know, even though it was the last year of his life. And it's rather nice for the people who don't know him, the public, that he'll be remembered with love and with laughter. Yes, oh yes, I hope so. He was a very silly man and made me laugh mm. an awful lot. And I will, Very silly man indeed. And I will, will remember him fondly, very fondly for that. One of the earlier very silly men was Phileas Fogg. Well, was he silly? He went round the world in 80 days. Phileas Fogg was very boring. I found was it. He? <laughs> the BBC said, would you like to retrace the steps of Phileas Fogg round the world? I said, well, jolly nice. They obviously wanted to get rid of me, <laughs> get me as far away from England as possible. So I went back and read the book Around the World in 80 Days, and Fogg comes out of this real bore. So I sort of thought, worried, why? <laughs> Typecasting again. Um, <laughs> he was a very typical Englishman, and the book was written by Jules Verne, and it was a real, real send-up of, of, uh, of the typical Englishman, who really did nothing else but play cards and uh, um, go to his club all day long. And he had this bearer, Passepartout, this sort of servant, whom he took along to sort of see the sights. I mean, the idea of Phileas Fogg actually going around doing the tourist bit was uh, out of the question, because that sort of Englishman sent someone to do that for them. <laughs> so that was Passepartout's role, to go and see the world, while Fogg sort of wandered about uh, swanning around with Indian princesses and things. Did you try to retrace his steps exactly? Um, well, we started from the Reform Club and we went as, as closely as possible along the route he would have taken, yes. Mm. It wasn't possible all the way because... Uh, no, you weren't allowed to use air travel. I couldn't use any aircraft at all. No. I had to go on the, on the surface. I wasn't really allowed to leave the surface uh, so of, of the globe. <laughs> <laughs> well, camels, rickshaws, um, dog sleds, uh, ships, obviously, um, across the sea. I tried cycling, but <laughs> it didn't work. Um, the, uh, silly, shouldn't I say that? Um, no, the, the, uh, the problem was that Phileas Fogg had passenger ships available uh, mm. over most of the seas of the world. They were the sort of prime means of communication at that time. We didn't have any of those. There were only cargo ships which are hard to get onto and, and even, more, <laughs> even more difficult to get off. Um, and their schedule is very flexible. I mean, we got on a, I got on a ship uh, at Madras. Well, we got to Madras hoping there was a ship that would leave. There wasn't one leaving for about four days. And the first one that was leaving was a Yugoslav freighter carrying human hair 
um, to Japan. Apparently, Indian hair is highly prized, so they have these big containers full of, uh, you know, barnets and uh, various other things. Onions, there's a lot of onions. So one, one had to get on that ship, and there wasn't room for an entire crew. They only would take two people. So Nigel Meekin, the cameraman, got on, obviously, and I got on, and I had to work the sound. Could you? So uh, during that sequence, you'd see a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> sort of thing. Did you did you find on your travels that there's there's a place that you'll never want to go back to, or, or a place that you must go back to, a nicest and a nastiest? Um, well, there's a, <laughs> there's a place I've never seen, which is Singapore. Every time I've been to Singapore, something has gone wrong, and I've had to go through in about an hour. So I quite like to actually see what Singapore is like. I would love to go back to China. I mean, we were there before the Tiananmen Square and mm. all that mm. stuff, but uh, it was absolutely fascinating. Um, China and India I like because it's a complete madhouse, but what we, it manages to, it manages its affairs on a very human scale, although everything in, in, seems to be in chaos. Mm. There's a wonderful spirit there and a great humor and a great feeling of sort of everybody getting by, you know, and their, their own steam. Um, people, places I don't want to go to again? No, I, I'm, I'm very curious, really. England, I'll probably miss out. Uh, will you? Well, no, no, it's all right. It was a bit of an anticlimax coming back, I must say. I, I was really looking forward to it. It was going to be the great day of the journey, 80 days away, or 81, or 82. Um, I'm not allowed to say. And coming back, you know, to see my family again was just, just was going to be the greatest part of the whole journey. But as we sort of came into Felixstowe and the boat docked, I suddenly thought I wouldn't mind if it turned around and went round again. <laughs> I, I wasn't ready for England, and it was... It was just before Christmas, and it was Christmas shopping, and everyone was bashing each other over the head with parcels, and there was, there was real hate in the air, <laughs> as only Christmas can engender, really. Uh, we tried to make our way through London to the Reform Club, you know, and sort of all these people, oh, get out of the way, you know. And no one wants to know you if you've been around the world. Yeah. You are the absolute bore of all time, you know, conversation killer. Before I ask you about the food and any problems like that, we've got a clip here, and I want you to tell me exactly what's going on in this rather strange I'll piece try. of filming. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, that was a cure for something, was it? Yes, that was actually, I was extremely ill at that point, you may not realise. And I was on this dow, just an open boat, and there's no medicine other than Coca-Cola was their sort of prescription for everything. Oh, I've said it again, more advertising. <laughs> so at least it's not Ken Wood Coca-Cola. I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I was just sort of lying there, really feeling really ill, miserable. I just wanted to go home. And Kasim, this, this, the, the old man of the sea, sort of just looked at me and said, turn over. So I thought, what? So I sort of lay on my back, and the next thing I knew, he was taking a walk on me. And that's what they do, it's sort of massage. And uh, it was excruciatingly painful, but at the end, I'd forgotten all about indigestion. Felt okay. It was just the pain in the rest of my body. It was but, uh, <laughs> he walked on me several times after that, and I think he brought out some sort of doormat. <laughs> BBC Michael, doormat. We're going to see um, more of this tonight on BBC Television Tonight. Yes, yes. Which will be lovely. After the, after the weather forecast. So don't turn off after the weather forecast. Will you stay here with me? Tonight? No, just oh, now just on the yes. sofa. Yes. Sorry. I'd love to. Just for the meantime, thank you, Michael Palin. <laughs>